Heavenly Father, how we need your word. Lord, make us dependent on your word. May we submit ourselves to you on the basis of your word. Help us as we go about our activities in this world, and there are so many distractions and lies that would turn us away from your word. Hold us firmly by your hand and by your word. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, last week we uh, discussed truth and what it means to be a, the people of the truth. Jesus came to testify to the truth, and especially the truth about God and about how sinful mankind can be reconciled to him by trusting that the death of Jesus Christ paid their debt of sin, paid our debt of sin that we otherwise owed to God. And we can and we do know true things about God by creation itself. Psalm 19 tells us and affirms that the heavens are telling of the glory of God and the expanse is declaring the work of his hands. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, he said, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, both his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. But there are things about God and, and things about our relationship to Him that humans cannot understand by mere observation of our surroundings. There are important truths that must be revealed by words and propositions, without which we cannot understand what is good and what leads to human flourishing. God in His grace sent prophets to tell of things that could only be known if God revealed them to us. But he, he went still further in His revelation by sending His Son. Hebrews chapter 1 begins this way, God having spoken long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways in these last days spoke to us in His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the worlds, who is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power, who having accomplished cleansing for sin, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He, he did what he came to do. He showed us God, and he paid for sin. And there can be found no higher or clearer revelation of God than that which comes by Jesus Christ, who made the worlds and who upholds all things by the word of his power. All reality rests on his word. Man is limited by nature. He does not have the divine attributes like omniscience and omnipresence. We as humans tend to assume that our personal experiences and our interpretation of those experience, experiences comprise reality. Moreover, since mankind fell into sin, his ability to think clearly without personal bias, without prideful presumption, has been negatively affected. And we live in a world that lies to us constantly. And that's not to say that man cannot think true things. He can sometimes because of co common grace that God has given us. But the entire inclination of the heart of man is away from God and toward self and reliance on self rather than on God. Jeremiah wrote concerning the human heart, in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can know it? And yet, the world tells our children, as it tells us, to follow what? 
follow your heart. They're deceitful hearts. The state of our own heart is one of the biggest blind spots for humans. But it's no mystery for God. The very next verse in Jeremiah 17, verse 10 says, I, Yahweh, search the heart. I test the inmost being, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Moreover, God's Word can diagnose the error of the human heart. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 and 13, it says, For the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the, the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are uncovered and laid bare to the eyes of him to whom we have an account to give. The Word of God can tell us things about ourselves that we could not otherwise know like the fact that our, our heart is deceitful, and without which we would be bound to judge things incorrectly. We just naturally do that. And this is all the more important since we are accountable to God for our thoughts about Him and about His world, about His creation. So I want to take some time to consider some of the truths about humanity that that God has graciously taught us and which are currently under attack in our world. There's a battle in the realm of ideas. That's why Jesus came to testify to the truth. Paul described the battle of ideas in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5. He wrote, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the tearing down of strongholds. As we tear down speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That's what we're called to do. And only divinely powerful tools can win this battle. For us, that means that we need to look to God's Word for the truth. We need to judge all things by God's word. One of the major points of attack that Satan has instigated of late is toward the nature of humanity. Now, it's not new, but it's taken some new forms. So I want to spend a few weeks looking at, the, at some foundational principles from God's word, answering the question, what is man? It's a question that Job asked with amazement and wonder in Job chapter 7, and, and that David asked also with just amazement at God's care in Psalm 8, and other psalms do likewise. We're going to use as our launching point Genesis chapter 1, so please turn to Genesis 1 if you have not already. Genesis 1 begins very familiarly, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Notice, there's no attempt to argue rationally for the existence of God. There, there's no proofs that are offered here. Moses just states God's existence as a fact and expect the reader to assume and to agree that God is. Of course, Moses himself had direct revelation from God on which to ground his own confidence. But Moses did not witness these events of creation that he recorded. No one did. Nobody except God. We learn in Genesis 1 things that could not be known apart from God. He's the only source that we have for knowing these things, God gave Moses this explanation of creation, including its vocabulary and its structure. Here, the, the God who created man with the ability to think and to speak and to communicate, that God spoke through Moses in the language of man, expecting him to understand. 
And God presented this record in the form of historical narrative. The grammar is very clearly and distinctly explaining events in sequence of time. This is true history. And also the, the days are described as evening and morning comprising each day, presenting each day as a single 24-hour day. And the days are numbered. Yes, the, the word for day can mean an undefined period of time, but not when, the, when numbers are attached to the word and when they are described by morning and evening. That can only refer to a single 24-hour period. So God has explained creation as occurring in six 24-hour periods. And the only way we could know that is that he told us that. In the first three 24-hour periods, God created the places and spaces, the heavens and, and the earth. And in the last three 24-hour periods, he filled those places and spaces. God set himself forth as a uniquely eternal being who existed before creation and who sovereignly created all the visible and invisible word, world by his word. All that is and, and that can be experienced by his creatures exists by his word. God's word is truth in a tangible and even physical way. God's word establishes and maintains what is true and what is real. All that is not God depends on God and his word for its existence. All the wonders of creation, all things that are big or small, visible and invisible, are upheld, as in Hebrews 1, where we read, by the word of his power. The creator God is, is distinct from his creation as the only one who has life within himself. He, only God has existence in himself. He told Moses in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, he said, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Jesus picked up on that same manner of speaking in John 8, 58, when he said that before Abraham was, I am. This captures God's self-existence. He has existence in himself. Nothing caused him to be. And Jesus possesses the same quality also. John 8, 26 says, For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. And in Revelation chapter 1, verse 4, John greeted his reader saying, Grace to you and peace from the one who is and who was and who is to come, referring to Jesus, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. God is self-existent. He depends on no one. He's distinct from his creation. Unlike it. Jeremiah 10, 12 says, It is he who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom. And by his understanding, he has stretched out the heavens. He shows his wisdom and his power by creation. And this self-existent, uncreated God on the sixth day, made a creature like himself. He made man. Look at Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, this is the eighth time in Genesis 1 that we read, then God said. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Now the word for God here is plural. But there's a single speaker. And God used here a, a plural of deliberation to explain what he intended to do. Let us make. Now, this by itself doesn't explicitly 
prove a plurality within the Godhead. We, we need other passages to prove the Trinity. But it certainly prepares us for it and allows it and it anticipates it by creating man in his image with a male and a female who form a one flesh union comprising his image. God said, let us make man, Adam, in our image, according to our likeness. Now, image and likeness are each singular. So this does not allow for more than one God to be included in the plural us. They have this, this, this one who speaks and says, let us, has a single image that he made man in. Now, we will address the significance of man as an image bearer next week, Lord willing. This week, we're looking at the significance of man as a creature. God said, let us make man. Man is a creature. Man was created by God. He did not make himself. He's not a result of chance. Chance cannot create because chance is not a thing. Chance is merely a statistical description of more or less probable events when the actual cause is too complicated for humanity to know or to understand or describe. Chance has no being. It cannot create. Man was created by the sovereign, sovereign creator. Man is, therefore, a creature. That means man that is dependent on God for everything and that God is dependent on man for nothing. Paul affirmed that truth when he spoke to the philosophers at Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17. Acts 17, 24 and 25, Paul said, The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. God is the self-existent creator of all men, not just of Adam and Eve. Psalm 102, verse 18, refers to future generations descendant from Adam and beyond as created beings. Thereby, they are obligated to worship God. Psalm 102, 18, this will be written for the generations to come and a people yet to be created will praise Yah. That's the shortened name of God. All humanity is created and dependent on God. God's expectation is that man would recognize his dependence and look to his creator for all his needs, whether those needs are material or immaterial. That includes knowledge. That includes understanding and wisdom. Psalm 146, verse 5 through 6, how blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in Yahweh his God who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps truth forever. Throughout God's relationship with Israel, he called upon them to trust him and to look to him alone. God regarded self-reliance as rebellion and as a Great offense to God. Consider Jeremiah 2.13. Jeremiah wrote, For my people, God's words here, For my people have done two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. They've turned away from the source of life to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. In other words, Israel failed to rely on God and preferred rather to rely on themselves or other parts of creation. Human wisdom, wealth, created power, other nations, for instance. And this is a continual temptation for human beings. It's, it's a temptation for us to think more highly of our own abilities than of God's. To, to think that we know better. To think that we can figure things out. Oh, how foolish. How prideful of us. We weren't there at the creation. We don't know what he did, except that he told us. 
Why would we make stuff up? This is often reflected, too, this pride in religious observance, thinking that your own salvation or your right standing with God comes through human achievement. Even though God's word is clear that only God's grace saves. Ephesians 2, 4, and 5 says, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. It's, it's, by, it's a God's grace, his gift to human beings that we have the ability to be saved through Jesus Christ. And yet, so many religions want to add steps to salvation that, that depend on the person. They add requirements that give the human a, an illusion of self-efficacy, that, that, that give a bit of the credit to the human being. Paul calls such adjustments to the gospel a different gospel that is really not another in the book of Galatians. And he pronounced a curse on those who follow such a man-centered and man-made religion. We must take God at his word. As creatures, we are dependent on God for life and for understanding that gives new life. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 says, For God who said, Light shall shine out of darkness, a clear reference to creation in Genesis 1, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Well, our dependence on God for life and and breath and for all things tells us that we are creatures accountable to God to obey Him and to worship Him. Hebrews 4.13 which we read before, says, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are uncovered and laid bare to the eyes of him to whom we have an account to give. We are accountable to God. We are accountable to praise him along with all creation. Psalm 148, verses 1 through 5 says, Praise Yah. Praise Yahweh from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all stars of light. Praise Him, heavens of heavens and the waters that are above the heavens. Let them praise the name of Yahweh, for He commanded, and they were created. As creatures, we must acknowledge our dependence on Him and recognize our need to be taught by Him to understand that His way is best for us. Worship Him as God and and give thanks. Honor and thanks are the very things that suppressors of truth fail to give to God. And that leads them into faulty thinking. Consider Romans 1.21. For even though they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God or give thanks. But, instead, they became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish heart was darkened. We must remember that we are creatures. But, although we are creatures, we are also special creatures. Genesis 1 shows us that in a number of ways. First, when we come to Genesis 1.26 and read, then God said, let us make man in our image. See, see what language, the language here has changed from his prior creative activity. With the prior parts of creation, even of the creatures that were created earlier in the day on day six, with prior parts of the creation, God said things like, let there be, or let the earth bring forth. God changed his pattern to include his personal involvement in his making man. Let us make man. It's more direct. Genesis 2.7 describes that personal involvement. It says, Then Yahweh God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And so the man became a living being. God breathed life into the man whom he had formed. That's the only creature 
that he gave life to in that way. Similarly, in Genesis 2.22, it says, And Yahweh God fashioned the rib which he had taken from the man into a woman, and he brought her to the man. There's, a, there's personal involvement here. The scripture does not apply to any other creature. Also, in addition to that personal involvement, we see a progressive ascending order of significance as the creation narrative progresses day by day and even throughout the sixth day. The sixth day has more information than any of the prior days, and God's making of man has more detail than that of the cattle and the creeping things and the beasts of the earth that God had made. God singled out man for extra detail. And he formed the humans last. And it's only after God had created man, this pinnacle of his creative activity over these six days, only then did he look at his creation as he did in verse 31, where he says, And God saw all he had made, and behold, it was very good. It was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. The light was good. The dry land producing vegetation was good. The great lights in the expanse were good. The sea creatures were good. The land creatures were good. But notice, only after man was created does God call the entirety of his creation very good. Mankind is the pinnacle of God's creation. Moreover, God created man in his image and likeness. No other creature was said to be made like God in that way. And we'll discuss that more next week, Lord willing. But further, the previous creation, including plants, were created so that they would reproduce after their kind. God created groups of, of living things. On day 5, verse 21, God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarmed after their kind, and every winged bird after its kind. Earlier on day 6, God said in verse 24, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after their kind, and it was so. Clearly, God had made them so that they could reproduce within their various kinds. But, look at verse 27, and God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Man was not created according to his kind. There's no discussion of kinds within humanity. Only with man is it recorded that God made man not according to kind, but it specifies male and female. Now, obviously, God had made male and female animals, but it's specifically not mentioned here as it is for man. It will be la later mentioned during the flood narrative, but here it's not, since Moses, in writing Genesis 1 and 2, are emphasizing the special family unit that God ordained for humanity. And we'll talk more about that in subsequent sermons as well. Well, still further, this special creature that God created, still further, God created man in his image with a purpose of ruling over the other creatures. I mean, that clearly separates mankind from the rest of creation. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness so that they will have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God gave the rest of creation into the custodial stewardship of man. And for this role of ruling, God gave man a special blessing in verse 28. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that creeps on the earth. Now, God had blessed the sea creatures in verse 22. But God didn't speak to them. 
Only to the man does he speak. Here God blessed them and God said to them. Only with the man created male and female did God speak directly to his creature. One last thing I want to mention here, I I noted that the other creatures were created after their kind. In other words, there were different kinds of sea creatures and different kinds of land creatures and creeping creatures and so forth. It doesn't say that for man. There's only one kind of man that includes male and female in one kind. There's only one race, the human race. God made no provision for separating humanity into different races. He made no provision for prejudice based on ethnicity or skin color. Paul understood this in Acts 17, 26. He said, And he made from one man every nation of mankind to inhabit all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. Now that should put to rest any assumption of there being different value, different intrinsic goodness to one group or nation or ethnicity over another. We all start equally depraved. That's where we're equal. We're equally depraved, equally condemned and and in need of salvation. There's not one group more depraved. God, forgive us if we favor one group over another based on superficial differences like skin color. We'll talk more about the value of humanity next time as we address man as the image of God, as, as image bearers. Genesis makes clear that man is a creature who owes everything to God, who owes allegiance and obedience to God, who is dependent on him for life and breath and all things, including clear thinking who owes God worship and thanks. When we forget to honor God as we should and we forget that he has shown us the good path by his word, we think more highly of ourselves than we ought. We we pursue means to our desired ends that are in opposition to what God says is honoring to him and what is best for humanity. We, We might even think that God owes us something when we owe everything to him. We, we think that God should be other than he is. We, we want to create God in our own image rather than the reverse. We even blame God for things in the world that, or in our life that we don't like, that displease us. Remember who you are, O oh man. You are a creature. But you're a special creature. You're not the same as an animal. As much as we love our pets and rightly care for the animals that God has given to us, they are not people. The worldview of humanity that that professes to believe that a man arose through evolution from lower animals is is wrong. It's false. You, You are not a distant cousin of a chimpanzee or a bacterium. And don't let the consequences of that lie affect your thinking as it can. Be careful about adopting language even in a joking way that suggests otherwise, as if your pet is equivalent to a human baby. It is not. It's not. It's a great blessing in our lives, but it's not a human being. God created mankind in a special way that deserves distinct honor. Now, this is what So puzzled and amazed Job and David, Job 7, verse 17 and 18, Job says, What is man that you magnify him, and that you set your heart on him, that you examine him every morning and test him every moment? Job recognized that there was something in man that God regarded in a special way, and David understood, too, that God is God and man is a creature, but a special one. And he made that clear in Psalm 8. Psalm 8 reads, O Yahweh, Our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, who displays your splendor above the heavens. From the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. When I see your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have established, what is man 
that you remember him and the son of man that you care for him. Yet you have made him a little lower than the angels and you crown him with glory and majesty. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the animals of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the sea. O Yahweh, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Don't forget that you are a creature, but don't forget that you are a special creature, specially regarded by your creator. And we'll speak more on that next week. David had the right perspective and he had the right response. His response was to say, Oh, Yahweh, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And one way that we remember together our dependence on God for all things and especially for salvation, his provision for us is through the Lord's Supper which pictures Christ's sacrifice for sin and our taking to ourselves his gift of new life. So let me pray for this supper as the men come forward. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your word and that it teaches us. Lord, may we not be turned away from your word by by worldly arguments and worldly claims but may we depend on you. As we depend on you for our life, we depend on you for our spiritual renewal as well. And thank you, Lord, for this reminder that you've given us in the Lord's table, that we can remember and proclaim the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.